And so now it's my pleasure to introduce our pilot team and then our asynchronous longtime faculty members. The first three panelists, and I'm going to introduce everyone now and we'll run through the panel after that. Our first three panelists are far and beyond a class of their own in so many ways I can't even begin to tell you. A league of their own. Um, our, our three panelists are part-time faculty but have taken this pilot to heart and have devoted, I can't even count the hours. I know that you have been counting the hours. <laughs> but that they are unpayable in many ways and irreparable in many ways, <laughs> to speak literally. And I want to take this opportunity to thank you for that, for the university, for the department, and on behalf of the faculty as well, and on behalf of our students who may not realize the kind of work that goes into it, although I know by your teaching evaluations, they do, and they absolutely love you, and we do too, so please know that. Daisy Bow, Andras Molnar, and Dorothy Potter Snyder, and so I will introduce the three of them. Daisy Bow is a part-time lecturer of French in the Foreign Languages Department and has taught asynchronous courses for us, um, as well as being part of this pilot on online synchronous uh, teaching. Daisy received both her MA and PhD in French literature from NYU, and she has been teaching at the New School since 2013. Her primary research interests are centered on French food and identity, with a second entrance, uh, interest in French perfume and culture. Andras Molnar graduated from Teachers College, Columbia University in 2015 with a master's degree in applied linguistics and is part of the inaugural online synchronous team here at the New School, having taught this year Japanese Intro 1 and Intro 2. He has taught English abroad in Japan, China, and Taiwan, and is currently teaching speech clarity at Baruch College in New York and Japanese language at Hunter College. He has worked with, a curriculum, uh, with curriculum design and teacher training at OK Panda, a company that tries to connect Japanese students learning English with teachers in a one-on-one -on -one digital platform. And last but not least of our team online, Dorothy Potter Schneider has been a Spanish language teacher for over two decades. She is a consultant to publishers of Spanish language educational materials and a literary translator and Spanish language curriculum developer for corporations and nonprofit institutions. Dorothy taught the inaugural Spanish Intro 1 on the synchronous online pilot platform in the fall of 2016 and has remained involved with a pilot in an advisory capacity. Her most memorable pedagogic experience was teaching basic Spanish for breastfeeding to support over 500 nurses and lactation consultants in a coast-to-coast -coast webinar. In the 1990s, she was the administrator of the nonprofit arts and education center, the Latin American Workshop in New York City. She earned her bachelor's degree in foreign languages and literature from Yale University and is pursuing her master's degree in creative writing at the University of the South in Sewanee, Tennessee. And our full-time faculty members, Sarah Villa and Mary Christine Massé, who I know many of you know as longtime faculty members and our former chair, Mary Christine. Mary Christine Massé has been teaching French at the New School since fall 2010. She previously taught at Carleton College in Minnesota and Drew University in New Jersey. Professor Massé teaches all levels of French, including advanced classes in French-speaking um, cinema, popular culture, and French literature. She served as interim chair of foreign languages from 2012 to 2015. She is also the regional representative for the American Association of French Teachers for the states of New York and New Jersey. And last but not least, Sarah Villa has taught Spanish and Italian for many years at Hunter College, CUNY, before arriving at the New School. Her doctoral work was related to medieval and humanist studies. Over the last year, she has focused on Spanish and Latin American literature related to issues of social justice. She has also sought to develop engaging classroom applications of film video to improve language acquisition. So thank you all, and we welcome our panelists. Thank you all for coming. So uh, hi, everyone. Thank you, Raul, uh, for the great introduction. 
Um, so my name's Andres, and I'm going to be um, starting us off today. Um, we're each going to talk um, individually about our, um, our respective languages. Um, but first, I'm just going to provide a brief introduction um, to kind of some overall terms, and then um, we're all going to get into our own um, specific talks. So in the order, um, Daisy's going to go first with French, uh, Dorothy with Spanish, I'm going to follow with Japanese. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it's been great um, to be part of this, um, this pilot. Um, it's definitely been, um, it's been, a, it's been rewarding and challenging, um, I think. Um, both, every language brings its own respective um, challenge to it, um, specifically Japanese. Um, there's Chinese characters to consider, um, pronunciation issues. Um, so it's, it's been interesting kind of adapting that to an online forum. Um, and I'm just going to give you a little bit um, of kind of a window into kind of what our classrooms um, look like. So one of the reasons um, the pilot is actually going on is to provide uh, remote language education for students abroad or off campus who want to continue with a language. For example, one of my students right now is in Texas. Um, she, um, she uses, actually, she doesn't even have a computer. Um, she uses her phone um, to join the class. So um, it, gives, it's a, it gives a really good um, variety um, for people who can't be in New York. Um, and I've also um, Skyped in guest speak or Skyped in, Zoomed in, I'll explain Zoom in a second, um, guest speakers from Japan. Um, so that gives me, um, you know, the option, um, you know, somebody who can't um, come physically to a classroom can just appear for five minutes on a screen and um, head right out again. So it's been um, great um, for with flexibility. Providing alternative medium to class for students busy with internships. I teach 8 p.m. to 9.15 p.m. on Monday, Wednesday. So um, students who um, can't come to the traditional hours um, have uh, this, the ability to take this class and can do it from home um, from in their pajamas if they want. Uh, so it's, it's really nice, um, again, very flexible. Um, maybe I might be teaching myself in my pajamas, <laughs> uh, but just from the bottom down, it's okay. Uh, so I look professional on top, as always. Uh, so um, and also uh, to explore um, modalities for a successful online synchronous language pedagogy. So, uh, so we're um, kind of the forerunners, but also to see um, how this fits into the new school. Um, so a couple terms. Um, so, oh, so we're going to be talking um, about synchronous and asynchronous. Synchronous is a live class taught um, on a video conferencing platform, much like this. So um, students can interact with me. I'm interacting with them. Um, it's completely live. Classes meet twice a week, and um, students interact with the teacher. And I'm going to be going. It's not all. It's not always just my face. Um, they can also see each other, talk to each other. And um, we'll be talking about Zoom in a second, kind of the options there. Asynchronous, um, an online class that uses online learning resources. So this is more in Canvas. There may be FaceTime, um, maybe not. Um, but I'll let um, Mary Christine and, and Sarah talk more about that. So then Zoom, um, this is our platform. This is one screen, the Dorothy screen, as you can see. <laughs> we, have, we start the video. Um, we can either, students have the option um, to talk with video. Um, without video, and um, occasionally, depending on where the student is, uh, the background can be very loud. Um, so, as a teacher, we have the ability to mute them or unmute students when uh, we want to make when we call them in class. Um, however, in general, um, we very strongly encourage students to stay with video on, uh, audio on, so they can um, be very quick with um, with responses. Breakout rooms. Uh, this is my personal favorite uh, function of Zoom. Um, so kind of one thing that I was very hesitant about before starting uh, teaching was how do, you, how do you do pair work, right? So a big, um, a big advantage of being in an in-person class is, okay, student A, student B, go. Student C, student D, go. Um, with Zoom, um, depending, I have nine students in my class currently. I can um, pick the amount of rooms I want to make. I can make, you know, two rooms. I can make nine, eight rooms if I want and assign specific students to specific rooms um, so I can actually monitor and control um, kind of, you know, putting a stronger student with a weaker student, um, making groups of two, groups of three. Um, I still have that flexibility um, that I would have in an in-person class. 
And also it's kind of fun uh, to do the random function too, because then you also kind of avoid having, you know, the students who always sit next to each other in the back of the room, you know, have to kind of join uh, with other students in class and everyone gets to know each other. It's, it's very friendly. Canvas, um, I think many of you are familiar with this. It's an online management, learning management system similar to Blackboard. Um, but if you work the new school, you're familiar with this. But, you know, to post files um, or, you know, this is students enter our digital classroom from here. Usually uh, post a link. They'll click the link and then appear in the classroom at the appropriate time. Um, and finally, this is what a classroom tends to look like. This is, this is um, from my intro one class from the fall. Um, and this class actually I had um, guest speakers come in. So these are actually... She, she was in, these two uh, were in Japan, um, I believe New Jersey, and then um, this is another new school teacher, uh, Hiroko. Um, so they, so actually she came and joined the class and was, they could actually see another Japanese teacher that teaches the new school. It's kind of cool. Um, and, but this is what it looks like. Then the students, um, we either do it Brady Bunch style, uh, where they're all kind of can see each other, or then I put, um, would pair students each, with each other and go out into the breakout rooms. But this is generally what a, um, a class will look like. So um, without further ado, I'll change it over to, uh, to Daisy. So um, I have a very unique experience on, experience on this team because out of the three of us, I'm the one who's been at the new school the longest. So I've had experience teaching the in-person language classes and also the um, language classes online, both asynchronous and synchronous. So what I'm doing today to kind of um, start things off is I'm talking about comparing on and offline classrooms to kind of look at what the differences are, what the challenges were, and what were my objectives and goals as I was crafting and putting the course together. So just to start, initial objectives, and this is from the fall, so the first synchronous online pilot was in the fall, and it was French Intro 1. So I had a few s objectives that I definitely wanted to make sure that I hit um, targets that I wanted to achieve, one of which was a seamless transition between my in-person French Intro 1 course and my online one. So I taught in-person French Intro 1 and the exact same class online in the same semester. I wanted to make the class seamless. And this meant avoiding creating two separate classes, partly because I did not want to make double the amount of work for myself, but also I wanted to make sure that for the students themselves, um, we're meeting the same communicative, cultural, and cross-cultural com competencies outlined in the syllabus. And furthermore, to make it easy for students to move from French Intro 1 online to the in-person French intro um, to person if they choose to take a course on campus instead of staying within an online platform. So one thing I wanted to avoid was having the student in the online course suddenly find themselves disoriented and destabilized in an in-person class because it was so different. And so I wanted to really make sure that I, I adapt things, but at the same time um, uh, have it be recognizable. So. What were my other objectives? Um, an emphasis on the student's online experience. So before I undertook the pilot, I interviewed all of my students. Every single one who had an online class, I asked them what worked, what didn't work, what did you like, what you, did you not like? And the students almost universally said the same thing. They liked classes that were very organized, that were consistent, that um, they knew what the expectations were clearly. And they also wanted to make sure that I knew that a lot of professors teaching online feel like they have to overcompensate for not seeing the student in person, so they assigned too much work. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make sure that the workflow was manageable, user-friendly, appropriate. I wanted to make sure that I was also understanding, flexible, and adaptable in terms of attendance, participation, and group work. Within an online environment, there will be things that will happen. The tech will fail, there will be a storm. Like last weekend, or last week, no, this week, um, on Tuesday, because it was, no, sorry, Wednesday, because it was tax day, mm -hmm. everyone was submitting their taxes at the same time my class was running. 
So half of the class had tech problems because everyone in New York was filing their taxes online at the last minute. So you have to be adaptable. You can't be so rigid in terms of the attendance and participation policy. You have to understand that there are things that come up. And if you work with the students, they will work with you. And so in terms of that, be responsive. So one thing the students overwhelmingly said was that they didn't like teachers who had an interaction with them online but never responded to email, didn't give them enough feedback. So I wanted to make sure that I was really there for them. And I didn't treat them like they were secondary students because I didn't see them in person. So that was my goal. So this is how I started. Same syllabus, nearly identical landing pages, same handouts, adapt to in-person activities, and mostly the same assignments. So here we have the landing pages for my online course and my in-person class. And you can see that they're virtually identical. Looking on to how I organized the course, for my in-person class, I could do one module per week. But for the online class, to keep them organized and on target, they had a module a day. That means each class session, they knew exactly what the handouts were, what they needed, if there were any videos they had to watch. And they didn't have to guess here. If they're in person, they know what they covered in class. But if they have to come prepared with these printed out, downloaded already, organizing it um, session by session was very useful. And so in terms of thinking about activities, this is where I had to get really creative. Because I am not the most computer literate person. I don't know how to code. I'm not a programmer. I had to kind of work with what I knew how to do. And I wanted to make different things that I do in the in-person class work online. Like for example, how do I play a game that has a board? How do I play a game that has dice? Or how do I play a game that has pieces that move around? So what I'm gonna show you is a game that I use with my um, in-person class. So for, for my in-person class, I have this board. And so for this board, you have these different numbers. Each number corresponds to a question on a list. So students in the in-person class would roll a dice. They would move a piece, like a piece of paper, to if they rolled a five, they would move to five. They would look at the list to see what question number five was. They would ask each other that question. And if they got the question right, they would advance to the next roll. And so how do you do this in an online course? Well, what I did was I created virtual game pieces. And then um, we're going to be looking at the purple piece um, in particular. But I also found out that there are a lot of websites with the virtual dice. So I put the link in the module. The students could be broken into groups and breakout rooms. Um, I sent each of the students the board ahead of time. Each group had the board ahead of time. Um, they had the link for the virtual dice. So one student was in charge of rolling the dice. Uh, one student was in charge of moving the pieces. And then they could basically do the same thing. So if they roll the virtual dice and they roll a five, they would go to the list. They would have the same list as the in-person class. If that was the question, they would go to that question, ask the question. If they got the answer correct, then they would advance their piece. And so it was a really great way to take something that I do in person and do it online. And it worked really well. I was really happy. Um, so that's one thing. Um, other things were adjusting assignments to these synchronous online classes. So this was something that me and Marie Christine worked a lot on before the pilot was launched. And we did this specifically because we wanted to make sure that we addressed the strengths of online learning and avoided the pitfalls of trying to cram um, uh, like a, a, a round peg in a square hole or vice versa. We wanted to make sure that what we had worked with the platform. And so what I've done here is I've made a comparison. We have the great breakdown for French Intro 1. And this is the great breakdown for French Intro 1 online. You can see that there are some differences. For one, um, there's no quiz because it's very difficult to give an in-person quiz in an online platform. So what we did was we divided the quiz grade between take-home quizzes and one-on-one -on -one interviews. So that way we were able to meet the objectives, um, the competencies for the course, 
At the same time, we were able to do something a little bit different that worked well with the platform. Um, secondly, we weighted the presentations a little more heavily because the students could do more. Um, they're at home, they're around a lot of props, they can definitely be more creative because they don't have to haul everything to campus. They should be, we should recognize that in terms of you know, what, what we expect of them and what they can expect. Um, also, instead of a final exam, we replaced it with a final project. And I'll show you an example of what a student did for a final project. But this is what we did. And so this was in the fall, and then at the end of the fall, I was already thinking ahead to the spring about how I wanted to modify it further. So here we have the French Inter 1 online from the fall, and this is the French Inter 2 online currently. And you can see that I've broken it up even more. I wanted to still keep it recognizable, but I definitely wanted to take more advantage of the platform. So here, what I've done is I've included these things called lesson responses. So I'm doing kind of more blended learning here. So what I noticed about the students in the online platform is that it's a little bit harder to hold their attention. I might be very entertaining, but their roommate is more entertaining. Mm -hmm. So is their little sister and their dog. And so you, you have to be able to accommodate for gaps in attention. And so one way that I did that is I put up um, lessons that I had done for my asynchronous uh, level one, level two courses. And then I just put them online and put a quiz called a lesson response that they had to read the lesson and then answer a few quick questions. But what I found is that doing that, the students, they were much more involved, they were much more engaged, um, they didn't feel lost. And so I, I thought that was a really good thing. Um, secondly, the written midterm was replaced by a midterm oral interview. So just one interview a lot longer. Well, I mean, not a lot longer, but we're talking five minutes longer. So instead of 10 minutes, they had 15. And it was great. It was great to be able to see what they can do. And I think that they were really impressed with themselves as well. Mini presentation replaced by a video presentation. Um, in an in-person class, giving a presentation, the students are really kind of, they want to see what their classmates have done. It's much harder in an online platform because if it's challenging for me to hold their attention, it's even more challenging for a student to hold the attention of other students. So what I've done here is instead of a mini presentation in class, they had a video presentation that they uploaded to Canvas and the students had to make comments on everyone's video presentation. Uh, finally, a final project instead of a written final. So we kept that. So this is what the lesson responses look like. So you have kind of a sample of the lesson, and then here you have these sort of mini quizzes. And you can see that they're quite short. Six questions, seven questions, just to make sure that the students have read the material and that they understand it. The great thing about these lesson responses is the feedback, because within Canvas, I can see the statistics. I can see whether or not the students got this lesson. I can see specifically which questions they did well on. I can see if any student missed a particular question. And it allows me to be much more responsive as a teacher in addressing things, because I can see <coughs> really what my students get and what they don't. This is the midterm interview topic. So one thing that I did for this is that I had the students collaborate themselves putting together their review sheet. So within Canvas, I used the collaborations tab to create Google Docs that were shared with the entire class. We used the Google Docs for a sign-up sheet. We also used it for this. And it was a little bit scary for the students because they were adding their questions at the same time I was correcting them. So they were kind of freaked out about that, but, but they got through it and they, they have some good ones like, have you ever been in an accident? <laughs> so this was what we did for the midterm. This is what they'll do for their presentation. So Canvas makes it really easy for students to create a video if they're not particularly tech savvy. So within Canvas itself, there is a button where you can record video and audio. Students don't have to worry about using an editing software or something like that. So it makes it really easy to set something like that up. And then this is an example of what we did for the final project. So for the final project, I asked my students to put together Pinterest boards on certain topics. 
And then for the final project, they had to submit their Pinterest boards. And then they also had to have an interview with me where I would ask them questions. This was um, a dream house that someone had created using vocabulary about the home, different rooms, furniture, colors. And I was able to ask the students, um, what is this room? How many people are in this family? What, how would you describe the style? And so it was a really good way to kind of have something spontaneous, but also prepared. And so what I found doing the online pilot is that it really influenced how I thought about my in-person classes. So my in-person classes draw a lot from my um, online classes, and I actually thought it would be the reverse. But it's kind of interesting how it creates a loop of inspiration, creativity, influence. Um, for example, this was something that I did with my online class. So I took advantage of the fact that um, we can use Google Apps and slides to share slides and do collaborative work. So I broke the students into four groups, and each group was given a template. They were given a template of an apartment, and then within Google Slides, you can share that template, and so they can all work on it at the same time. And so the students were actually furnishing these apartments in real time in class. And then when they were done, they uploaded it, and you can see that they've added descriptions about what they did. So this was something that I thought was really great, and it also gave me ideas for what to do with students you know, in the in-person class, if they're working on a presentation, if they're working on group work. This is something that they can use to collaborate and produce something really, really cool. So that's what I did with my class. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And I, I want to remark before I get going here, I'm Dorothy Potter Snyder, and it, it's been an utter pleasure working with these two people to my right. Uh, one thing that's important to say about the online synchronous pilot was that it was a truly collaborative experience. Um, between the three of us, we were very supportive. Each one of us had different things to offer to the project and uh, so so offering different things and working together and being adaptable uh, is what I'm here to talk about. I, I taught this class beginning Spanish as a new teacher at the new school and I taught it from Hillsboro, North Carolina. Uh, I had no experience being in the new school with the faculty. I knew the faculty online as well as I knew my students online. Uh, so I want to talk a little about adaptability in the online synchronous uh, platform. Um, first, I'll just say that um, as a new professor at the new school, I have to bring this up a bit. <laughs> uh, as a new professor uh, here, uh, the things I had to adapt to, what were they? Uh, they were Canvas. I had used Blackboard before and other such forms, but not Canvas. Forming relationships with other faculty members, uh, ad adapting to new technology, um, enrollment issues in my class, which were more uh, thorny than in the other sections. Um, student realities uh, here at the new school versus my expectations of what their realities might be. Uh, and also, of course, course creation, syllabus creation, and some, so on and so forth. So some of these were sometimes problematic from afar, basically because I did not have a fully flowered idea of what normal is at the new school. Um, and so I had to adapt over and over. Again, so the materials I was using were the panorama, which uh, all of my students and I had a physical copy, um, as well as an online super site, and then um, teacher-generated materials on Canvas. Um, what I found was that at the beginning, I was very desperate to have hard copy of everything, but I found that the hard copy really didn't get used that much. Uh, mostly the super site was important to us uh, for comprehension and speaking practice, students on their own. It, the Panorama super site was quite 
good and quite complete. Uh, also, it offered automatic grading, which Daisy told me at the very beginning, make everything automatic, Dorothy, it's really important. So the automatic grading was fantastic. Uh, integrating of apps, outside apps I like to use, like uh, Prezi, Quizlet, YouTube, um, various other apps that I like to have inside Canvas, um, and also a huge nod and bow to the tech people, especially James here at the New School, who were constantly available to help work through, especially uh, integration issues with Canvas and Canvas Quiz, which I believe I used a great deal more probably than you guys. I really worked hard on Canvas Quiz. What didn't work so well with materials, um, when the Panorama Supersite didn't work, which sometimes it didn't, um, students got frustrated with it and would sometimes completely abandon that kind of exercise going forward. Uh, and some of those were the more, um, you know, a, a conversation with someone or, you know, things that required their microphones and everything to work well, or maybe the site was just malprogrammed. Uh, so that could be difficult. Um, the super site wasn't that easy to integrate with Canvas, so while the grading was automatic there, it was hard to integrate with Canvas grading. Um, the super site for Panorama had really was like, more like a textbook for a brick and mortar class that had been put online. That's how I experienced it, and that's how my students experienced it. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that um, it didn't contain the kind of kinetic activities that Daisy was referring to that we could use inside the class to work with the students. So, and it also had a lot more stuff, and it's not an inexpensive book, so it's, it's questionable that you want to make people buy an enormous book that's quite expensive when you're not going to be able to use a lot of what it has because it doesn't actually function online. So I found that the super site was great for student work at home, but I ended up, like my colleagues, creating things to do uh, online with them myself, program things for in-class activities, and also summarize structure and so on for them. Um, right, so, adaption. Um, adaption is really being creative and positive in an uncertain situation. And as my colleagues have already expressed to you, there's little that is more uncertain than an online synchronous classroom. Um, for both the students and the professor. So adapting, adapt, adapting ourselves to teach in the classroom that is online, I, I can't emphasize enough, we have to adapt as professors to teach in a certain way online. You cannot take a brick and mortar class and simply put it online. We have to learn new modalities. And that can actually be really painful uh, but through the pain, we discover creative ways to solve problems. Um, professors who want to teach in an online synchronous language classroom, which from here on out I'm going to call OSLC, and you'll understand what I'm saying, uh, have to challenge themselves to rise to new levels of emotional adaptability, cognitive adaptability, and also behavioral adaptability. So do the students. Um, as Daisy referenced, it's a lot more likely that things don't go well. Uh, there are many moving pieces in the online synchronous classroom. Increase in distractions in the OSLC um, requires us to invent ways to keep them immersed on the screen. And you might think that that's not a big problem. People walk around New York, I haven't been here in six years, and everyone seems to have a telephone in their face, and yet get people into a classroom and you really are fighting to keep them there. Why is that? Um, 
we have limited time here, so I'm not going to go deeply into it, but I will simply say that I think gamification and doing the kind of things that my, especially Daisy was inventing with that fabulous board and drawing in technologies that can force the student to remain on the screen is very, very important. One of the things I did actually to make that happen was to exponentially increase the amount of presentation that was happening in the class. I kept screens very much like this. I kept a lot of images on screen and kept a lot of conversations going. Um, almost every week there was a mini presentation to do and mini presentations were always followed by question sessions. So I had other students knowing that they needed to engage with the presenter after the presentation. So presentations were never just someone talking and everyone applauding. There would have to be response. Um, I think that students require administrative and our support uh, to adapt to an OSLC. Um, and one of these things has already happened. I'm delighted that with course listings, we're now, you know, they are understood to be synchronous, and, and hopefully the classroom is somewhere, right? It's not no classroom, there is a classroom. Uh, we shouldn't assume that all of our students know how to work the technology. <laughs> not, not all of them do, and it doesn't matter how old or young they are. Sometimes a young person will present without knowing how to use Canvas, without knowing how to use the camera on their computer, so we have to be ready for that. Um, and we, I think, are well advised to make instructions on how to take the online synchronous course part of the course, right? So what I learned to do after a few, what I adapted to after a few early baubles in my course uh, was to integrate quizzes and exercises that tested them in using the various technolo technologies and things they would have to do in order to participate successfully in the course. So learning to take the course should be an upfront thing. Um, so to adapt to the OSLC, we professors have to break out of our old ideas of what a language class looks like, and we can't just digitally imitate a brick and mortar class. Um, behavioral adaptability. So it's adjusting your style. If you've been teaching a certain way for a long time and it's worked for you, that's great, but then you get on the online synchronous classroom and you're like, what's going wrong, right? It's not working. And there are all sorts of reasons for that. But we have to be ready as professors to, to adjust our style. So here are some actual scenarios from my course. A uh, student is panicking in September. I have to come to class? I thought this was an online class. Uh, me, completely dumbfounded. Uh, you sure you don't know how to use Canvas? Uh, student whining. Uh, well, why can't I come to class in my robe and my slippers? And you know, I'm looking at Daisy right now because the things we've seen on screen, we don't want to tell you here today. Uh, me, you know, what, you know, why are my, who are you talking to on the phone, you know, while we're in class? So, so <laughs> these are actual scenarios. And, and actually, this required adapting my style. Uh, it, in a very extreme way. I had to um, learn that, uh, that, you know, I, I just had to learn a different way of dealing with problems I'd never seen before. Um, so it was kind of like a blind date, being on an synchronous, a synchronous online class at the very beginning. It was um, for both the students and for me. Uh, none of us really knew what to expect. I had taught online for 15 years, so, but mostly adults, not new school students. Um, and I wasn't used to having a course in which the levels varied so much. So, 
So I had to adapt a way to deal with students that were CEF level A1 and those who are at CEF level B2, actually, uh, in my course. Um, I had to cut homework hours or at least adjust homework hours for students that had full-time jobs and were taking too many credits. Um, behavioral adaptions I made, I invested, uh, as Daisy was referencing, a lot of time in conference calls with my tech support. Um, I reduced homework hours. I radically increased uh, class time spent on pair work. Um, that kept them uh, occupied uh, and conversing. And I radically decreased the amount of written words displayed to students in the class and dealed mostly with images and conversations to reach our goals. So keep calm, carry on, emotional adaptability. Uh, it's accepting failure with a smile. Um, Failure happens in the online classroom uh, probably with more frequency than you're used to. Um, and Daisy also referenced this. It's, it's, you know, it's natural for things to go wrong. And uh, it's very easy to kind of freak out because what you're doing as an online synchronous professor is like producing a TV show. So you want it to go perfectly. You've planned beyond belief. You spent hours timing every little thing. And then something doesn't work. And you have to stay with them, and you have to move on. This is mostly the professor's adaptability. So w the important thing is a pilot like this, and I believe for many years, synchronous online education is going to ask professors to take a lot of risks. Hmm? We have to take risks if we're gonna move this forward. This means being emotionally adaptable to the fact that a lot of things don't work. There's no guarantee for success. Sometimes experiments fail miserably. So the Quizlet game doesn't work. The programming of a Canvas quiz is faulty and students are emailing you and saying, I can't do the quiz, what am I gonna do? Your entire internet connection fails. So um, the OSLC demands a high level of our emotional adaptability. When tech doesn't work, you move on. But you must continue to experiment knowing that things may go wrong. Uh, we need to keep seeking out apps and games and ways to make the online synchronous experience exciting. Uh, we have to stay calm and adjust our technology on the fly, forgive ourselves quickly when something is a flop, fail better next time, keep smiling. So as far as adapting, um, you know, one other thing I'd like to say about, about, um, wait a minute, did I miss something? I did, I missed my apple. Cognitive adaptability. Um, you know, very little to say about this except that my customary PPP classroom kind of turned into a PP classroom uh, in a way <laughs> um, because I really stopped presenting in class, and I think this is a really core thing. Um, it was too much time, and I did not feel it was effective to present in class. So in the online synchronous environment, we flip it. Uh, students were expected to prepare, and class time was only for activities, practice, and presentation. That's it. So you're not, or I didn't, and I found it useful and effective to not spend class time showing. Huh? Not spend class time showing, only class time practicing and presenting. And allowing time in that period for interaction between students and also guests in the classroom, as Anders did. So finally, because we need to scoot on, um, I have a sense that this is, this is a project that's really worth pursuing. And I've told Raul that I really feel that this environment is tailored for the continuing education student. Um, I think that 
as we adapt our tools and our pedagogies to online synchronous study of language, what we're doing is we're creating a global classroom. And in order to do that successfully um, and be a leader in doing that, which I think the new school can do, uh, there are some ways forward. One, programming, uh, investing in things like Adobe Creative Cloud and other softwares uh, that can help professors have something more than you know, PowerPoint to, to create things on screen. Um, I'd be curious about foreign languages par partnering with the School of Media Studies to develop digital storytelling tools for foreign languages, um, high quality documentary clips of Spanish speakers here in New York City and cultural artifacts, um, and also partnering with professional associations to start creating bespoke online synchronous language classes for people who are seeking certification in certain fields. Uh, I've done this many times on my own, but I think the new school is totally set up to do this sort of thing. Um, to become a global leader in innovative online synchronous education will require adaptability, but I'm absolutely sure it's worth it. Thank you so much. All right, so I'm going to uh, spend a couple minutes talking about um, synchronous online teaching with Japanese. Um, so um, Japanese was uh, a little different than um, French and Spanish in that there was no super site. So I think another um, kind of adaptability is one of my main themes as well. But um, just as um, just coming to the realization that not all languages are equipped really for online um, teaching. Um, Japanese especially um, is kind of behind the times. Um, the, um, the, book, the book is fine. Um, however, um, the book's website, I think, hasn't been updated since 1999. Um, so that's kind of also, and they're one of the more online um, you know, um, textbooks. So um, there's, there's a lot of, again, um, teacher adaptability coming in. Um, myself bringing in um, you know, apps, Quizlet, YouTube, um, others as well. And um, also just um, a lot of personal kind of uh, similar to Daisy um, things I can't do in my online in my regular classroom um, in person um, adapting to the online um, making pair work um, you know more um, you know the people they can't hand each other things so I'm um, being just more ready for pair work there's a lot of uh, preparation that goes into that um, but there's a lot of um, the creativity that comes with it and kind of being um, being in a box and kind of having to think outside it is also was very um, you know fed back into my in-person class as well um, so going along with that um, one of the um, main difficulties I had um, which is a little unique um, to Japanese and would also go into a Korean or a Chinese classroom um, would be um, like Chinese characters um, so Japanese has um, two three scripts, um, f two of which are phonetic, um, which are pretty similar once you learn them. Um, there's about 48 in each. Um, they're pretty, they're very easy, and most my students at this point have no problems with them. However, um, the, the kanji, the Chinese characters, um, there's several thousand of them. Um, so it's really, even for a Japanese native speaker, it's kind of a lifetime um, of learning them. So how do you really, um, do that in class. Um, so that's that's very difficult. Um, a lot of times a teacher can just, oh, how do you write it? Oh, um, here's to pick up the chalk. Boom, 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 done. Um, however, I in my first semester teaching intro one, I had to, all right, guys, hold on. Um, let me get up um, the online whiteboard. And then I'm like there with my mouse, like, ugh, ugh. <laughs> Uh, I felt like I was like scratching like things into into the whiteboard, so it's it's difficult. And even even with that, there's no um, adaption for for handwriting or more the calligraphy. Um, and it's it was it was a little challenging. Um, so um, adapting in um, gifs and other um, you know more you know things I've I've had to borrow from online that show show writing style, or just relegating it. Um, 
another, well, I'll talk about this in a second. Um, with homework, um, since there's no super site, um, we have uh, the main textbook, but also a, um, an accompanying workbook. Um, students would have to, you know, physically handwrite um, the, the pages and then take either pictures with their phone and upload that to Canvas, which is, um, which is fine, but then was um, a bit difficult to kind of have to put on essentially text boxes onto um, homework and grade it. Um, however, you know, it, it, it eventually um, kind of worked out and um, I started to have to having to think ways around it. Um, so um, the result is I, I tried to keep um, the my online class as close to an in-person class as possible. A lot of my PowerPoints are the same, um, very similar um, to Daisy and Dorothy as well. Um, however, there's a bit of um, testing and also homework was, was problematic for me. Um, yeah, so practice reading and writing was more difficult um, in the class, so I just kind of relegated that more um, to homework and kind of um, specific assignments, whereas um, class time, again, I myself um, focused more on listening, speaking, and more task-based um, skills. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, and it's also, I'm, I'm, I think by this point, I'm being very, rather repetitive of my colleagues. Um, assessment, um, so, how do you get around um, the no paper tests, um, which is, again, as Daisy mentioned, um, you know, you, you arrange your syllabus around that, and also, um, that also opens up a gap um, in class time as well, um, whereas in a normal in-person class, you, you budget an hour or so for a test or even a class period for a test, so now I have an extra class, and that um, will also affect um, the material I use and have to produce. Um, so that's, that's where I was inviting in um, native speakers, um, which I can just zoom right into the classroom and do, um, you know, have collaborative tasks with the native speakers. Um, so this um, really um, makes my online class much more student-centered or had make me, not that my in-person class is <laughs> teacher-centered and me just drilling them, um, but it's, it's, it also, the adaptability was um, very important. Um, so I just wanted to show um, a couple um, things that I've been doing in class. Um, so this is, um, I've been doing integrative projects. Um, so um, Daisy mentioned video uploads. Um, so this is, rather than um, for many presentations, I would go at the end of every chapter, five chapters per, um, per semester, um, a student, I would give them a very, uh, a task. Uh, for example, um, one of the, um, one of the chapters was about um, clothes and buying things. So the task is um, Sensei's um, wardrobe was infested by bed bugs, and so he needs a new wardrobe. So can you please make um, suggestions? Um, you know, clothes using clo using clothing words. Um, um, what what appropriate prices? I have a, a limited budget, and um, otherwise things like that. Um, so then um, students, um, essentially it's like a video blog, um, would, you know, maybe about two minutes um, speaking, ask, going, kind of going through, um, hitting um, the specific tasks, and then other, other students would comment on it. And I would have um, one, at least, at least five sentences, or three to five sentences in Japanese, and then an English critique of what, um, how they felt, you know, students' pronunciation was and whatnot. And that gave them, um, that kind of ch checks off listening, speaking, reading, writing, um, kind of a complete um, picture there, and then also a little bit reflective, giving the student who did the presentation uh, a little bit of um, feedback in English so they can kind of um, adapt as well. Um, and then uh, this is stolen straight from Marie Christine. Um, she had a uh, fantastic um, online uh, workshop a couple weeks ago, um, and this is um, Padlet, correct? No, it's not Padlet. Which one is this? The Storyboard, okay, so I, I have a couple new um, new websites floating around in my head. Storyboard, um, so students can actually, and this was actually really cool, um, specifically for Japanese. Uh, manga is something, um, the, you know, um, comic books that students actually take Japanese class for. They're really interested in um, comics and anime. Um, so then giving them a project that can, they can actually make their own. Um, we recently did a uh, informal speech, so there's different um, formalities of speaking in Japanese. So um, 
take your friends out um, over the weekend and they could do, um, you know, make speech bubbles, um, move characters around. It was, it was really fantastic. Um, so this was uh, just, again, something that they can do uh, in class and using more online tools. Um, for me, just quickly, a couple um, disadvantages or kind of weaknesses I found. Um, again, just uh, summarizing what I had said earlier was the kanji, the Chinese characters, was a little difficult. However, with um, help with manga, um, you can kind of overcome that or the handwritten homework. Um, Japanese language is itself is kind of the like, I don't know, it's, it's weak with online tools, so kind of finding them myself was kind of difficult. Um, and not every, um, I feel like um, Dorothy and um, Daisy alluded to this a little bit. Um, students have to be very, um, very enthusiastic about the language. Otherwise, they kind of lose momentum. Um, they'll stop um, maybe doing the online exercises, or if there's a technology issue, they'll just give up. Um, so kind of having a students that are more, um, that really want to learn, and um, I've, been, I've been lucky to have those for Japanese, um, I think it has been good. So I think um, just one of my suggestions would be um, encouraging very independent learners for online classrooms. Mm -hmm. Um, advantages, um, similar, I found speaking sim similar speaking time between my online and my in-person classes. Um, I was forced to make them more student-centered to kind of be, um, you know, the, t the TV host um, and try to, to maintain attention. Um, and also, th this was, for me, was really great. Um, just getting guests from Japan, um, just kind of um, my own um, either former host parents, um, friends that have since moved back to Japan, or even getting other um, new school teachers in the classroom. So um, I was really excited to have um, Hiroko Miyashita come in because she um, not only does intro classes, but she also does independent studies classes. And I'm like, hey, look, here's another teacher. And isn't she fun to work with? Don't you want to continue taking Japanese? Uh, so this was another um, kind of really nice um, tool for me. Uh, and then um, also can access the classroom from anywhere, um, Texas, New York, um, wherever they happen to be. And um, little difference in grammatical or spoken uh, ability from the in-person class. I find um, the, the same places that students in in-person class have difficulty with in online. And um, you know it's, it's really the same uh, pitfalls. And then you just kind of focus it on those areas. Um, so it's, it's, been, um, it's been similar, and it's been um, really nice to have to, to the creativity um, that I've had to adapt to um, in the online class has been um, good, I think, just as a professional, and then going back into my in-person in class um, as well. So I'll let um, Daisy finish up. So I'm going to wrap up really quickly with some closing comments. So um, first of all, we are three teachers, three languages, and three different experiences. And I think that talking to all of us, uh, Andras, Dorothy, and myself, you'll find that there are a lot of things that work for me that might not have worked for Andras, or that work for Dorothy and then fail miserably for me and vice versa. So it really is three completely different experiences. And that's one thing about the online platform, is that you, it's just much more unpredictable. Um, in terms of teaching online synchronous classes, um, it presents unique challenges and difficulties in terms of lesson planning and preparation. So initially, there is, it's very front-loaded. Initially, there's a lot of prep. But once you have created these things online, then you can begin recycling, just like you would with a regular in-person class. But lesson planning and preparation, you do have to be prepared for a lot of different things that you wouldn't have to be prepared for in an in-person class. Um, again, the initial amount of time it takes to put together an online lesson, uh, the investment is going to be higher because you just have a lot of different working parts. Um, developing in-class activities, you have to really start thinking out of the box, becoming more creative, and really trying to think to yourself, what is it like on the student's end? Um, when I was developing my activities, I always thought about what would it be like if I was on the other side of the screen. and. Um, it, it definitely <coughs> is a necessary perspective as you put something like this together. Um, assessment, different. Uh, we all had to meet challenges in terms of what do we do if we can't give the students a paper exam all at the same time. I personally don't want to watch 15 students with their heads down scribbling mm -hmm. away. <laughs> so we have to get kind of creative and think about different ways. 
um, retaining and maintaining student attention. That's something that we've all had to work with. Um, and also in-class etiquette during synchronous online sessions. I think that we've all also had experiences with students who as they become more comfortable with their classmates and with us, they show it. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we have all had to build in sort of additional things into the syllabus in terms of dress code, um, uh, how, what kind, it was an appropriate background environment. Uh, we've all had to emphasize that students should sit up and not lie down, so certain things like that. And then again, technical issues. They will arise, you will have students who might not be able to have their video on, or you might have to repeat yourself multiple times because there's a storm and, the, and it's interfering with your connection, so technical issues do arise. Um, however, um, it is an ambitious project with great potential. Um, overall, I think that it's our experience that students in our fall 2016 synchronous classes performed just as well as their peers on campus. And now that I have the French Intro 2 class, I have to say that I am so pleased with the level. Um, I think the flipped classroom activities and the flipped classroom things that I've adapted have worked, and so the questions that I'm getting from my students, they're much more technical than questions that I would get from my in-person class. Like, they really kind of want the nitty-gritty. Why is it like this? Why do we do this? I saw this example in the book. Why is it like that? And I haven't had that often in my in-person classes, so that's something that is encouraging. Um, we are all in agreement that Zoom works really well for these kinds of courses. It enabled us to simulate the feel and the pace of an in-person class um, in an online environment, and that was really um, essential to kind of having this seamless transition between the on-campus courses and what we were doing. Um, online courses like ours give students more choices in addition to the freedom of being able to join from anywhere in the world. Um, however, as we've all pointed out, um, uh, all three of us, synchronous online classes are not for everyone and they're also not for every teacher. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Not every teacher is going to like teaching online and not every student is going to like taking an online synchronous course. Um, there is a steeper learning curve for the students and the teachers. Um, however, once you overcome that, I find that my students now it feels much more like an in-person class because now they've overcome that learning curve. They know how the technology works. They know how to interact with it. And I find that class planning is faster. Lesson planning is faster. Getting them on board and getting them to do different activities, it goes faster because now they're used to it. But the learning curve, it is something that we've all had to adjust to. Okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> Thank you very much, online synchronous team. So uh, I see a couple of hands, and we'd love to take questions, but we've decided that we're going to actually go through the whole presentation and then take questions all at the same time at the end, because we do have two other presenters who will be telling us, um, uh, Sara Villa and Mary Christine uh, Masse, who will be uh, describing our asynchronous um, courses, uh, grammar and composition, and I'll invite them up. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the uh, asynchronous courses that uh, Sarah and I teach. We're not going to be as fancy as those three, <laughs> uh, but we'll basically what we did is we talked together and we decided there's a couple of topics that basically we've been dealing with. Some of the things we do uh, similarly, some things we do differently, so we just tried to put everything together. Um, so the objectives for our presentation is to share some of the best <coughs> practices for synchronous teaching and uh, share our observations regarding learning, how our students are learning and their outcomes in an in a, uh, asynchronous environment. So those are the topics that we came up with. The design of the course is very important, uh, how to develop course content. Uh, the assignments, we'll be showing you some of the assignments. Uh, interactions in, a, in an asynchronous class. Assessments, and finally tips and challenges for teaching in an asynchronous environment. Okay, so the design we were going to talk about uh, next is um, 
we thought of it as the skeleton, right? So it's very important um, because it's really uh, our platform, uh, the point of departure really, um, to engage students and with them and uh, make their learning experience the best possible. So it should be clear, our design should be clear, easy to navigate, always um, user-friendly and uh, consistent but uh, flexible. So, um, so in fact, um, for example, um, uh, last semester when I taught for the first time the, synchronous the asynchronous class, um, we had um, uh, our uh, James Acevedo uh, gave um, one um, of his workshops and uh, I remember specifically that uh, they were telling us how important it is to have, um, you know, to, to incorporate um, as many videos as we could, right? And of ourselves explaining or ourselves just chatting and telling students, mm -hmm. um, uh, communicate stu with students uh, some relevant points, right? So that was one of the things uh, for flexibility. Um, so try uh, that, that, uh, that's, that was one of the things that um, um, actually kind of changed during my semester and so uh, I decided that after that that I had to include something like that especially because in mid-semester during uh, my mid-semester uh, feedback evaluation that I gave uh, last semester they were telling me uh, students were telling me that they needed they wanted um, more communication right so after one after a few weeks I decided that that was one way of doing it Okay, so, um, oops, sorry, I went too fast. Um, so this is my uh, Spanish grammar and composition, and I only have one level of Spanish grammar composition, which is intermediate, low, mid, um, and uh, Marie Christine has two levels. Um, and this is my home page um, in Canvas. Everything is on Canvas for me. Uh, there is nothing else outside. Um, and if I can go in, I'm not sure, I would like, would like to show you something very quickly. I don't think I can. Um, these are the technical difficulties that we have been talking about. Um, yes? No? Okay, well, I'll just explain it. Unfortunately, I won't show you, but uh, my, the bulk of my work is on modules. I have everything there. A student sees everything. My modules, I have my lesson and my assignments, and my course is designed uh, basically first week, they have lesson, grammar activities, and discussion posts. Next week, the, the week after, they have the same thing. Lesson, grammar activities, composition. And it's always the same. So if you go in my canvas, you yeah. see module, first week, lesson, activities, discussion, second week, lesson, activity, discussion, always the same. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's important, I think, that the structure of the course, the design of the course, the skeleton, uh, is consistent and, uh, and the same for me, mm -hmm. for my experience. And I think that students always look for that, always look for that um, for the not getting lost in Canvas, not like all over the place, material that is all over the place, outside Canvas, too much stuff. And so I think that one of the problems uh, that uh, maybe uh, Dorothy was uh, referring to was that um, there, w there were too many pieces. Mm -hmm. right? Panorama was already a lot, and then on top of it, we had to integrate with other stuff because Panorama was not sufficient, although it looks like an encyclopedia, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> right? but it was not sufficient. <laughs> in it. Anyway, um, so, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is my design. Uh, this is my landing page, and thanks to Daisy and Shira who left, uh, this is how they encouraged me to work on my landing page and to really make it as, as a map, basically, of where everything is, so that when they, when they arrive, they know where they have to go. So when they arrive, I tell them, this is what we're gonna do this week, and this is what you gotta do, and like Sarah, it's the same thing every week, more or less, uh, but they can just click. They don't have to go into the left menu. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all there. Uh, so, so that was very helpful, actually, hmm? to, to work on that. 
so when they know where to go, these are the different spaces where they have to go. Uh, because everything is a little spread out, you know, like not everything is in one page where I would have all my videos, the exit. I decided not to do that, but just to have different spaces and they know what to do in each space. So this is the uh, space where they have all the, the course material, basically. So the videos, whatever, uh, those, those little questions there, they have to do while they watch the video. That's why they're there. Uh, then I have, then the other page is the modules where they, there's also, it's a little repetitive, but that's where they go if, I don't know, they missed the landing page, it would be there as well. Uh, then there's the space where there's the exercises, what I call the bilan grammatical, which is the diagnostic that they have to do every week, uh, both, for, both for grammar and vocabulary. Um, then I have the discussion, that's another space where we do different things as well. Uh, this was an example with videos where they had to record themselves. The discussions are usually assigned to one student to lead the discussion and I participate as a student or make comments on different things. Uh, they participate well on this, huh? although they're not, you know, I'm not there. Um, okay. Okay, so this was more or less our design. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so the course content and developing course content. Um, for grammar and composition, both for Spanish and French, uh, it is a challenge because there is nothing out there already um, available uh, for online delivery, right? So, um, and what we have uh, found, um, yes, there are textbooks for grammar and composition, uh, but not transferable to the online environment. And also, even if they were transferable, uh, they are kind of dry and sterile as textbook, right? So, um, especially since it, it is an online course, we want it to be uh, engaging. And so, therefore, uh, we have to not just, you know, uh, scan and transfer stuff, but uh, create material that it's really appealing, right? And uh, so, uh, there is a lot of uh, that, um, as uh, I kind of think it's a repetition of what you guys have said, but um, um, so audiovisual materials is very important for us. And ours is a different kind of course, right? It's not, um, you know, it's not a, um, a regular language course, it's just grammar and composition. So, uh, and it's asynchronous, right? Which means that um, the, um, the, uh, the live uh, component is, if non-existent, just a little bit. Uh, so, um, so, so the tools, the tools that we used, um, you know, more or less uh, in different ways, and uh, maybe you know, one semester more, more of some than others. Um, I just want to say mm -hmm. one thing about this one. These are like I don't know how it went for you, but when I started teaching, I was trying, I was spending hours preparing material. Uh, yeah. You know, so I tried the PowerPoint presentation, I did audio, so I was recording myself on the phone, transferring that audio into the PowerPoint. It would take me five hours to do just that, you know. Uh, then I decided to uh, go on Zoom and do a presentation on Zoom, record that. That was not very good. Okay, uh, but it's doable, right? Uh, then, or then I would grab some uh, YouTube videos and make a mishmash, cut everything, then put video together. It's very time consuming, uh, but it was still not exactly what I wanted to do. And so really the, the last thing I'm using now, uh, is, uh, exclusively in uh, this semester, is VoiceThread, because then I can put my video in and I can sp uh, speak over. Uh, so, you know, I can turn the sound off if I want and just, you know, speak and this is actually the easiest thing I found if you mm -hmm. have to create uh, material from nothing, okay, you want to think about the time that you're going to be spending 
uh, and I think the voice thread is really good. Mm -hmm. And Sarah has used other, uh, other things. Yeah, too. for, for mm -hmm. me, um, my lesson consisted more in uh, a video, uh, not all the time, it changes uh, continuously, but um, uh, sometimes with a video of myself with Zoom, uh, sharing my screen and, so, and my material uh, and pointing at things, um, and, but not just that, that only three, four minutes maximum of that. I don't have, you know, long videos um, of me explaining things. And then, <laughs> and then, and then my page, the page in uh, Canvas, uh, where I include my video, right, uh, also has, um, you know, links, links, infographics, pictures, videos that, you know, uh, that are um, teacher uh, created, right? Um, and that's how my page is. Also, I learned that you don't want to overwhelm students with a long page of uh, material uh, that students have to like scroll down and there is more and there is more and there is it's never, you don't want to do that either. So, um, yeah, there are, there are ways of avoiding that. Um, even just visually, maybe you do want to give them three pages, but not all at once. Right? So you break them down, you can do different things. Um, okay, so these are, um, maybe we should go a little bit faster. Um, these are assignments. So assignments, uh, of, co of course, they're according to the objectives, the learning objectives that we have, and these are the ones for Spanish intermediate, for the, I'm sorry, for the uh, intermediate um, asynchronous uh, grammar and composition. And so uh, these are some of the assignments, right? Um, basically, they go hand in hand, right, with uh, uh, the objectives. And so <coughs> this is what they're supposed to be doing uh, at the end of the unit or the two weeks or one week. Um, and so, yeah, so for the, the, uh, the assignments, we probably have similar assignments at the intermediate level. I just added the ones uh, the that events. I... Uh, for the, um, the advanced class, uh, the, the composition number two, uh, you know, different type of discourses, and then at the end we try to put everything together, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, that way. Uh, so. And I think one of the feedback that I always got in this two semester from students is that they really like the fact that the grammar is tied to the discussion post, or to the composition. So it's never like, you know, just grammar to give grammar, right? Mm -hmm. But it is really has a purpose, right? And they see it. So that's, in, and that's, I think it's the most um, uh, useful thing for them. They say it, you know? So it's very important. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is one of my discussion posts, just so that you see it. Um, so, and I wanted to show it to you just because it's not just, uh, this is what you, this is a topic, just, just post a discussion or uh, write a comment, right? So it's guided, right? Uh, they have to do things before they get to these. And that's why it goes hand, hand in hand with the grammar structure or the vocabulary because I also give them, they also need vocabulary, right? So here you see, uh, after you have done this work, and this is highlighted because it's a link, and again, you can never have enough reminders and enough <laughs> ways of putting, you know, the work in the same page, right? Because then they come up, they come to you and say, oh, I, haven't, I didn't see that, I didn't see what it was, but so I always put it in, right, all the time. A link to the lesson, hmm, so that they can go back all the time and refer to it. A list of vocabulary, for example, and then uh, test yourself with this exercise before you even go to the discussion so that the discussion is actually be going to be meaningful. Right? And they always have to, and I learned this from Daisy, they always have to um, actually post a comment on another person's uh, post right, all the time. Otherwise, their discussion is incomplete. Mm -hmm. um, so, and uh, what else about this? Mm, I think nothing else. Uh, and I guess I wanted to show you the type of assignments. I do have assignments that are auto-graded, and I have uh, assignments even in the grammar, right? Um, some that just, you, know, you see the red one is the computer that corrected it, and then I have one, some in the grammar activities, right, uh, that I have to go in and check, right? So I always give a balanced 
uh, number of each one, uh, each kind. And this is the one, for example, that is, uh, they, have, they have the situation or they have, you know, question, I'm sorry that you cannot read it, um, but um, yeah, they have some questions here, they have to choose, I think they have to give advice in this exercise. And so they have learned, you know, the subjunctive, but they also have learned other ways to give advice, not just the subjunctive, because we don't just use that to uh, do that. So, um, and they have to then uh, choose one situation, any situation, and, and respond, right? Uh, and here is the response, for example. Um. Oh, and I get, and the other uh, sample that I wanted to give you was the composition, right? So uh, every second week, right, um, I give a composition that should be longer, of course, than the post and the discussion post, and is again guided, right? So here, for example, they have to write a letter, and unfortunately, I cannot show you, but this is much longer, and it gives more details on how to write a letter um, and what to use, and even what what are the names of the part of the letter and all of that. And then this is one letter that I got from one student, right? And this is my corrections. Hmm? I use the, I, I grade and correct everything on canvas. Um, I, you know, I like it <coughs> and I think uh, students like it too. They, it's everything is there. And I leave my comments there. Um, I know that there are ways of also leaving comments with an audio instead of doing this. And some students like that as well, uh, to just listen to, and you can actually speak at length <laughs> about a composition and give you know, very detailed um, um, comments, but um, it's really a matter of preference. I don't prefer that, I prefer to write them. And in the, uh, finally, this is another uh, composition, uh, but um, it's one of the first that they have to write. It's about um, a trip that they have taken, and they can do it in many different ways. I want them to use pictures, of course, and so some of them use Padlet. Uh, some of them just put it in a Microsoft Word with a picture and you know, their description of what they have done, um, and some of them were more fancy with other things, um, but I give them also a list of possible um, app that they can use to do this, and they do it, okay? Um. Okay, so yeah, some of those assignments that Shara showed, of course, I, I also do. Uh, I added some, uh, this one, like the collaborative writing. I started doing this in the level two, and it works great for some students. It doesn't work so great with others. Hmm? Okay. So, for example, this one, they wrote uh, an argumentative essay, it was really good, and this is some of the correspondence, the exchange, you know, in comments. Like, for example, this one says, Hi, Anastasia, I wrote my thoughts here for introduction. Tell me what you think, please, and don't hesitate to add. So, you see, they work really working together, and in the end, we have a good product. So. And then some students were emailing me saying, I haven't heard from Elizabeth, where is she? What's going on? Um, yeah. uh, so, so, but it's really, the result is great, I think. The fact that they can actually work together huh, is really good. Uh, on the type of assignments, I love giving them, uh, asking them to put subtitles in a movie. Okay, oh, especially okay. a silent movie. Uh, so it's not that you can see this one, there's a big mistake here, uh, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, but at least they, and then in the end, at the end they have a short that they have subtitled themselves. So, you know, the writing is not, of course, the, you know, an argumentative writing, it's another type, hmm? okay? But uh, I think it works really good. Some students have complained because they don't really, they say they don't know how to use it, but in the end they do. It's really easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that on YouTube? Uh, that was a, uh, it was a movie from YouTube. It's a, a short, a silent short. It's a story between, you know, those two characters waiting at the bus stop. And so they had to basically, it was based on using uh, passé composé and imperfect in French, the two mm -hmm. tenses. And so they had to, you know, to write, to put the subtitles of kind of not really subtitle, kind of a description yeah, of what was happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, I gave them also another movie where they had dialogues, so this was really uh, uh, subtitling. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
Um, so because this is an asynchronous uh, class, we would think that there is no need for interaction. But I think just precisely because it's an asynchronous class, we need to have some type of interaction. Otherwise, it's like a ghost town you know, in, in the course. And so those are some of the interactions I, I worked on. Uh, faculty student interaction, I have two online office hours a week. I have to say, though, at the beginning, I had a few students, but now, Either they're too busy, yeah, but I'm there, but, you know, they... they how to do it. Uh, <laughs> the, well, no, I mean, some students, they, have, they email me questions, you know, but they could come to the office hour. And they did at the beginning, but it's, you know. Uh, the video self-introductions that I do at the beginning of uh, the course, uh, where they have to introduce themselves to the class. Uh, we do two face-to-face -face interviews, one at the beginning of the course, uh, where we talk about the course, their expectations, and then one at the end. And then the student-to-student -student interaction, the collaborative writing, uh, the discussions where one student has to lead the discussion. Uh, that's If there are other ways, I'll be happy to, you know, uh, to, to implement them. Uh, then we have another category we wanted to talk about was assessment. Was that me? Mm -hmm. It was me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so this is the breakdown of, uh, for example, of my composition number two, uh, you know, composition and all that. So it's, it's a little spread out. It allows you to uh, not just grade the compositions or the grammar. Uh, I do at the beginning of the semester also a diagnostic assessment. Mm -hmm. Uh, where, and it's, it helps me because if suddenly, if I see at the beginning of the semester, the student is barely making it, and then suddenly I get this wonderful composition, uh, then, you know, uh, there's a problem. Right? A problem. <laughs> so it, this is very useful, and also they tell me really what they, uh, what they want. I'm always surprised when I found out that their main goal is to speak French, you know, and I'm like, this is a, a composition yeah. class, yeah. but anyway, so I don't know how they ended up, you know, end up in that class. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is yeah. useful. Um, okay, I do. So when I meet face to face with them, I do uh, an interview. Uh, we talk about, you know, have they taken a, an online course before, and uh, what are their objectives? So I have the diagnostic in front of me, and I said, "This is what you told me your objectives were." So, you know, like in this class, what are the activities that we do that are the most useful for you to uh, fulfill that objective? So we talk about that. Uh, and then I asked them in the following week, what are some of the things that they would like to do more? Uh, and then I asked them to rank all the different activities. And last year uh, was very surprising what they told me. But basically, the video introductions you were talking about at the beginning when I talked to them, they were like, don't waste your no, time. Thank you. <laughs> Not useful, you know. At least, least useful. Okay. What is most useful? Useful was the presentations. Mm -hmm. You know, the video with the voiceover. Mm -hmm. They thought that was very useful, leading them to all the rest. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so, but this is very. It's it's an assessment. You know that I do at the midterm, a little bit after midterm, and that's very useful for to help me plan. Uh, the rubrics, of course, you know, for the compositions. Uh, okay, so now we just uh, conclusion on the challenges of teaching asynchronous and mm -hmm. maybe some tips. Um, mm -hmm. okay. So um, I think that we agree um, on a lot of things that they have previously said, and, uh, but I think there is something that um, they uh, didn't, prob didn't encounter and this accountability because they see them, they are face to face all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And they see them, they're there, they speak to them and they have ways of actually doing tests, that, you know, oral tests, for example, interviews that we don't have to do or we can do, right? Or not, you know, not for the whole thing. So accountability is important because we don't know actually who is doing the homework <laughs> back there. So, um, so that's a problem. That's a problem for which we don't really have a solution uh, because we cannot proctor anything. We cannot, you know, even, um, although we don't give an exam, right? Um, uh, so when they submit their homework, we don't know who has done it. Uh, so that's a problem. And then, um, and then the GO students, we have noticed that uh, uh, 
this is a tendency that actually we should study and see um, and compare numbers um, because um, we have noticed that we have GO students even in our face-to-face -face classes uh, sometimes <laughs> because we have uh, auditors, for example, that come and then at mid-semester on, not all, not all the time and not in all the classes, and, but um, then they start not coming anymore because they have too much, they have their thesis, they have their, you know, all of the other classes that they're taking for credit that they need to work on and blah, blah, blah. So we have that. And that happens in our online classes as well. And especially with auditors, because I have cases of auditors that have told me, sorry, but I have to take care of the other three credits, four credit classes that I have. So that has happened, and um, I guess, um, I mean, in my, for me, I, I would like to see uh, numbers, right, and compare in general how much of that happens in other courses, in other online courses that are not language courses, but other, you know, uh, disciplines, uh, and compare numbers. And just one more thing mm -hmm. about the GO students. Some of the GO students are registered students, undergraduate, taking it for credit. Okay. At some point in the semester, they stop doing the work. Okay. So yeah. you start emailing them, no answer. They flood, no answer. The advisor sends an email to the student, no answer. So the advisor emails, emails me and say, I'm sorry, there'd be no answer. So what do you do? What hmm? do you do? And then, you know, at the end, they're going to, you know, they're going to arrive at some point and say, so, so I had one who came and she said she was having mental problems and all that. So finally, we met face to face and we made a plan. But those ghost students, there's n we have no way of getting to them. Yeah. No way. Yeah. If they decide that they're not going to appear anymore, then and I look at the statistics and I see they went to see the homework. So they went to see everything, you know, it shows, but they're gone. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, they're not, they're here, but they're ghosts, you know, at this point. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the last is time, the last, I mean, the last one that we could think of is, uh, was time, and uh, it's, uh, it takes an enormous amount of time to prepare each of these lessons. And, um, and, but the first time, after the first time you do it, as they said, it's all there, and my, um, my advice and my, uh, for my experience, from my experience, I think that um, you should prepare it uh, thinking that this is going to, that your material uh, can be used by someone else yeah. and it's all there already prepared and you don't have, they don't have, they can tweak it, they can change a few things, but the bulk of it, it's there. And once you have done it one time, mm -hmm. for the first time, the next time is going to be so much easier and so much less work. And I have already seen that, you know, this semester, for example. Um, so so okay. the, the so tips. these are our, you know, our tips. <laughs> um, yes, be clear from the very beginning about what kind of course um, you are teaching. And so to them, repeat continuously, you know, and uh, like Marie-Christine said, oh, but I wanted to um, be good at, at speaking in French. Yes, but this is a grammar and composition course. So uh, <laughs> we are not going to be doing that. Um, but also on what is that we are doing, right? And how are we doing, how we're doing it, how we're reaching it. Okay. Communicate, communicate before the semester starts, everything. And, you know, repeat yourself because at the beginning they're not going to look at their email, they're not going to uh, read it, so then you have to, you know, the first week I found that the first week you're really not going to do much. Uh, you're going to start the week after. But the first week you should bombard them with emails say, or, or just put, you know, clearly what you need them to know, you know, on Canvas. I have on my page, I have, you know, the first week introduction and what you need to know what you know how you need to familiar what you need to be familiar with okay um be consistent this has helped me um, i don't know if it works for everybody but um for me and actually it kind of helped me structure you know uh, my other classes in a way you know be become more organized in other you know in other mm, classes so um it is something that requires a lot of disciplines on us, but also on them. And in fact, and they know, they say it, they know it, they express it, um, you know, all the time. Uh, it takes a lot of organizational skills 
and uh, discipline and motivation to be in an, in an online course because they're on their own and mm -hmm. so they have to be more responsible. They are also, they are also surprised if they never do an online course that it takes more work, work than they have thought, yeah. right? Yes, mm -hmm. they exactly. come with the assumption mm -hmm. that it right. doesn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then they quickly realize that it's not Even true. Even though they are if more they savvy have, than us because they're younger, right? Yeah, if they haven't taken any course. Because I have had students that actually surprised me. This semester I have a student who told me that she has taken, she has had, she has um, taken her diploma, high school diploma, completely online. I never even knew that you could yeah, do that yeah, actually, mm -hmm. you know, a high school yeah. diploma. So, um, and she told me that, and she said that, you know, she was used to, you know, being so organized and on top of everything. So um, be specific, yeah, be clear, be specific, very few words, uh, what you want to say. And, um, and be yes. creative, <laughs> you know, be creative because you can, they can, they can become passive so easily, you know, so if you're not creative and you're not challenging them constantly, then, you know, they fall into this um, passivity and, and then they don't accomplish that much. So, okay. All right. That's all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Where, are you. Where are you doing it? What kind of tech support do you have? Um, well, I just use my laptop and the microphone on my laptop I found was sufficient. Um, my internet connection, I live in Manhattan, and um, I've been told by Verizon that I'll never get Fios because it's too expensive to dig up my street. So <laughs> whenever I have a class, I come onto campus and make sure that the internet connection is strong and stable. Um, it's a little bit inconvenient, but if I was teaching an in-person class, I would come onto campus anyway. So I'm lucky that I don't live that far away but um, making sure that my technology is stable on my end, make sure that there are less problems for them. Yeah. Right, that's mm -hmm. my other question. I had people in Poland, Paris, pa Pakistan, and Tokyo, mm -hmm. and as you can imagine, the level of internet connection mm -hmm. was very, mm -hmm. uh, do you have that kind of problem and how do you deal with it? Absolutely, we had that kind of problem depending on the day, and to answer your first question, yeah, I. Because I've been running a lot of online classes with a lot of people, usually uh, professional folks who are learning Spanish for a, for a, for a particular reason, a very focused reason, uh, I have a big honking screen on my desk, so I'm using my, my laptop, but I have a very, very large sort of uh, editorial office style screen that helps me run a lot of things at the same time. Um, so I think that made a big difference. For, I, I have a pretty powerful computer. I have a really fast, I've, I've kind of created a media center in my own office, I guess, pretty much. So I think that's really important too, that um, you, you really have to have a computer that is set up and cleaned up and sped up to run this kind of class. You can't just bring your, your daily laptop that's jammed with stuff and you can't be running a lot of uh, applications at the same time. And uh, I found that I did not have success running the class on um, Wi-Fi. I run it hardwired. Um, and just just having that space, you know, having having screen space to, you know, I don't have to show everything to the students, but it's nice to have screen space to have various things that you're going to draw into the class because, you know, I had a, an hour and a half with them and I needed to pull things in fast to not waste time, so. Yeah, um, I actually teach uh, from my house, um, so I'm on my, my laptop um, and I use Wi-Fi. Um, I've never had a significant, every once in a while I get a hiccup, but never a significant problem. But um, my problem actually comes from, so, you know, I have a lot of original materials and getting the students to download them. And um, so I need to make sure that my, my class is almost immaculately planned. Um, so I upload everything prior to Canvas, and then I, I unlock activities as I go, um, go down, like, through the hour, 15 minutes. So it's it's extreme amount of preparation, and then on top of that, um, I'll I'll be like, okay, guys, go into pair work, and I find that um, even even though I've opened it 
and it's been up on canvas for like five or six minutes, people are still downloading it and still downloading it. And it's just like, it, it's like endless. So it's just having, um, kind of thinking of creative ways and kind of keeping file sm uh, sizes small, that there's a seamless um, interaction. And um, you're always going to have some problems, um, but just um, kind of, you know, being cognizant of that um, is, is what I, I do. Mm -hmm. The very first time before they even started with the online pilot uh, that I uh, taught the synchronous uh, intro one, um, I remember that we we didn't we weren't even using Zoom, and uh, instead we were using Adobe Connect, and before that. Uh, like a week before that, uh, the people in uh, distance learning had told me that to use, um, I think, conferences on Canvas, right? Mm -hmm. And conferences on Canvas was a disaster. Mm -hmm. So the first week, I, I couldn't even have my uh, session because <laughs> I went in and I was in my office here in the here at, uh, the new school, and uh, nothing. There was like it was it was shutting down, you know, all the time. I was opening, shutting down, and then I would receive an email from a student. Saying, where are you? Uh, or how do we get in? You know, that. So it was terrible. So then uh, the people in distance learning, uh, they actually monitored. So I don't know if this is something that is feasible, but they, mon they were there uh, virtually while I was having my uh, class. Wow. And so for, for like the first week, second week, third week, and then they stopped because there were no more problems. But the first three weeks they were there kind of figuring out, you know, if there were, James was there, mm -hmm. actually. Oh, James. Yes. Oh, so um, <laughs> that could be an option, <laughs> you know, um, um, at I least to figure out, you know. This um, I actually have a, a quick question for you in terms of how big your class was. It was uh, only five people okay. last day. So, and we were mm. just using a group site, right. uh, mm. and it just kept dying or people mm -hmm. were so lost mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and yeah. then came mm -hmm. back. But I mean, I know that for us, and this is something that we didn't bring up, but um, for the online synchronous classes, mm -hmm. our class size, our maximum class size is smaller. So for the in-person classes, the maximum is 15, but we cap ours at 12, mm -hmm. specifically for the reason that when you have that much data going back and forth, right. um, the more people you add, the more the quality of the audio and the right. video degrade. Mm -hmm. So we, have, we handle a smaller group than the average mm -hmm. in-person class, but we do that specifically to make sure that the tech has less problems. Okay, I never taught anything online, but the reason I'm here, because for instance, my German book has a mini site, not a paper site. And the publisher provides a PowerPoint, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm even inside. So I use those tools. And uh, bravo for the prior tools that we had with Marie Christina Pena, which is great. And, and I'm here to ask this question about like specific things. For instance, I, I'm teaching also the Français Composé in German is the same as in French. And we have like this a sad story of a uh, YouTube picture story, like just pictures of this kid that is born and gets married mm -hmm. and this very sad story and it's only 120 frames right and I thought this is really suitable and now I, 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 I post on canvas and ask them simply look uh, every for every class we meet twice a week we're gonna tweet 10 frames and then we will bring it to class every one write and I edit bring give them a second but it is a lengthy process this is really hard in my specific question is, um, Sarah mentioned there is this, this tip of, in technology that could help you, like I could just sit down, right, because I'm asking where to get help, but in my specific question is, we have a YouTube video, we could then after we did, they brought, the, we got the 120 frames, which will take two weeks, then we could subtitle it, like what you did or whatever, I have no idea how to do it, mm -hmm. and so, and I'm overwhelmed and I'm very excited because since I have a mini site and, uh, and I think this is important and students like that and like to record themselves and like to watch stuff. So as a person who is not teaching online but we have classes where just not everything has a super site. And in this case, 
where could we get help specifically subtitle a YouTube um, video? Is that hard? Where can I go? Yeah, I think, yeah, th that's what you said. I mean, get uh, you can get help from the distributed learning office. Uh, as long as you're teaching a course, you know, you go to them, you ask them specific questions. Uh, Shira also was, she was the person that was standing up here. Mm -hmm. She, every time I have a problem, I go to her and she makes suggestions and, What's you know. The distributed learning, it's on, it's on seventh, seventh floor. floor. Seventh floor. Mm -hmm. And you have to make an appointment, you know, with them and they'll help you with that. Uh, you tell them specifically what you're trying to do and you know, you know so and, and to address yeah. your your question also i i think that that there is an argument to be made that there needs to be a forum for sharing the lessons that each of us individually have learned working with different applications mm -hmm. and using them mm -hmm. you know i mean this is that forum mm -hmm. right here mm -hmm. but i think we're always all of us trying new things. I saw a few things up here from what you were working with, um, Sarah and Maria Christina, mm -hmm. that, that I haven't seen. So I think there's an argument to be made for some sort of, I don't know, primitive message mm -hmm. board or, mm -hmm. or place right. where experiences mm -hmm. can be archived, not just final products, because I also bow to you saying, once you've got this stuff, we really need to share this stuff because it does take, yeah. you're talking, you know, five to 11 hours to put together a really kinetic and beautiful class. Well, that's a lot of time. Once it's done, it's done, but it needs to be shared. And we also need to be looking at ways that things we've already d done can be done better, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. so. Yeah, because mm -hmm. every one of uh, our mm -hmm. teachers at the foreign language knows mm -hmm. how to use Canvas, at least to the point to go in there, make an announcement, and to keep the files of uh, answer keys and whatever there that is from a, you know, that perspective, like PDFs, right? But then uh, if we maybe as a foreign language teacher would learn how to subtitle a YouTube video, every one of us, that, that would be like below Canvas Plus. And, and that's such a, a cute thing to do, right? In any class, yeah. right? Maybe if we had, yeah. uh, that's a second, that's a suggestion on my question, if we had maybe a, um, a, uh, a class, a seminar, where Marie Christine or, or you, anyone, uh, it, it teach us how to use only two things, because it's, it is fantastic and bravo, but it's overwhelming, do you see? And I think that this online thing is also part, is good for us who are not teaching mm -hmm. online because sometimes our mini sites are too many, right? Mm -hmm. But then <laughs> if, if we could have a, a little, um, mm -hmm. if I say atelier, where we could learn how to subtitle a video, mm -hmm. and then maybe a uh, next one, mm -hmm. how to do this. Yeah. Well, um, I, 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 um, I have to say the one thing that I really appreciate being on this panel is that I've learned so much from all of my colleagues. And my classes would not be successful if my colleagues were not as generous as they are. Every single one of us has shared and have been grateful <coughs> to have things shared with us. Mm -hmm. Like for example, um, uh, one of my presentation topics is actually an adapted one from Andras. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't know about Quizlet Live if not for Dorothy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth, you know. I mean, I, since Sarah has done so much online learning before I even came onto the picture, her experience was invaluable. And every time I speak to Marie Christine, I learn something new. I learn about a new app, a new way to think about material, a new way to organize, um, the grade breakdown, like the way she had it, beautiful. Mm. I would never have thought to do that. Mm. That's great, it's great to learn from my colleagues. Uh, additionally, learning from James, I spent literally hours online yeah. with mm -hmm. James, learning how to use Canvas Quiz well for language. Um, and I finally got good at it. <laughs> Uh, but really good at it. So, and, and you know when you're asking technology, when you're asking James a question and he has to think about it and get back to you, that you're inventing something new. So if you're inventing something new, that lesson needs to be saved mm -hmm. because 
I did quiz. Mm -hmm. I actually quizzed regularly in my class, and I did give a final exam that was a combination of a Canvas quiz and a one-on-one -on -one with me. Mm -hmm. And by the time uh, I was at the end, they were, they not only did I know how to program those quizzes really, really well for speaking, for comprehension, for writing, but they also knew how to take them, you know. Um, Can you record in Canvas too? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's see, my see those, those, those things, <laughs> see, maybe a simple thing, how to record on Canvas and how to subtitle a YouTube video, mm -hmm. that would be enough for one afternoon with wine. So we have uh, two more co questions, right. so and then we have to cut Noel. Well. Yes. yes. Uh, when I judge grammar and composition, and even now, now it's not online, but like for intro to, I would like to record some little, not mini conference, so to speak. No way. And the, f the first time I did that for grammar and composition, I had the hardest time, not because I didn't know how to use Canvas, but because the sound on my computer was terrible. And, uh, you know, I mean, it was hardly audible. Mm -hmm. So I finally used the cell phone, transferred it. And mm -hmm. Now I bought like a professional microphone and I'm going to meet the uh, people mm -hmm. on the seventh floor to get help. But <laughs> yeah, how to synchronize a microphone with Canvas mm -hmm. too. That's another technical yeah. uh, challenge. <laughs> but I was wondering if there is any place, say if I, if I am in between class or uh, you know I am in school, if there is any place where there is a computer mm -hmm. that you can use, and if you bring like, yes. do we need a mic or get mm -hmm. you know, to, to either audio record or video record something, mm -hmm. at least as a try. Mm -hmm. Do we have such a thing? Mm -hmm. I'm sure that the people in distance learning would if you book you know, mm -hmm. with them a, a session, they would help you record, and they actually told us that they would also do videos for us, right? So you could go there and actually have them record you in video. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure they will help you uh, with that as well. Unfortunately, we don't have a lab or a computer you know, center mm -hmm. where, but not. That's yeah. only 13th Street on the seventh floor. Yeah, but, yeah, but it's but booked so, so you book You book a studio. Yes, you I know, but you practice as a lab. Yeah. I know you can book a studio, but yeah. there, is a, there are a lot of people who <laughs> want to book it. <laughs> it's a long line. But this one is like, yeah. So we, we will definitely follow up on this, uh, Noel, and, and get uh, more information. But I wanted to give a, a couple of final a couple of final comments before we end because we do we are we are recording and and we do have a reservation for a time to end. But first of all, I want to thank our panelists, each and every one of you, and I want to say a couple of things with that. Thank you. Your your work um, has been historic in many ways. And I'll tell you a few other things, and many and many more that I could tell you in the future. But uh, partly, our division and uh, the School of Undergraduate Studies has begun having meetings that are using Zoom because of us, mm. because one of the first meetings, and that is historic in itself. Um, one of the first meetings that we had to organize this, we used Zoom, and a couple of, use, of us used Zoom, and the dean used Zoom, and then we started using Zoom. So just that in itself is historic because the, the more comfortable we feel with this technology, the, the bigger and more impactful difference it's going to make in our classes. And so I have many, many things to say, but I'll cut myself short and, and, and just very much say that um, you touched on so many things. The, the fact of archiving um, your own experiences, our own labor of love, um, is, it has, has been done in an essence. Uh, we have been able to you know, do assessment, which we really didn't get completely into today, other than the fact that we have an organization of the beautiful, beautiful information that you gave us, but that is in a way assessment itself. Um, we, we have had one workshop that Mary Christine and Mary Laura Hoffman did earlier in the semester, and we are having this event today, and this is just the beginning of what we hope to do. 
Um, we're having pilot year number two next year um, with the same three languages. We hope to have Chinese, but we are waiting one year to do Chinese the following year. Um, uh, grammar and composition continues to be offered. Um, there is a lot that's gone on, and we have applied for a grant at the university level, um, which we are still waiting for a result, but um, all of the participants were involved. Uh, Mary Christine and Sarah were, were the co-principal applicants to, to, um, the, to the grant, and we're waiting for that. We're waiting to find out, and we will continue to have workshops and further professional development for all of our faculty and times for us to enjoy with each other, which is hopefully what we will do even for a little while today with some of the refreshments. So thank you all for coming um, and thank you to the panelists for your wonderful work. And we hope to have you more and more time. I know uh, two of our, our, our colleagues will not be joining us next year, but hopefully will join us in the near future. And, uh, and this is a space uh, that we hope to develop. There's so many things that you touched upon that I'll, I'll definitely follow up with each of you and hopefully in another session just like, like this one today. I also want to thank our phenomenal um, staff, our program manager, Sabine Lisain, for her work. Um, <laughs> Yes, very much so. Um, and our, our uh, student assistants, Raven and Wayne, who have been here as well. And our full-time and part-time faculty who is here in the public and, and um, is part of our, of our great work that we do. So thank you all and have a great weekend. And please join us for some refreshments. Thank you.